fanciullo! Grazie fanciullo! Grazie fanciullo! Hundred million people, it was a record uh, for um, a made for television movie. But very few uh, followed up uh, that night of uh, of terror and uh, dislocation uh, with an action uh, like our moms. So November 24th, uh, 1983, four days later, uh, my mom is one of seven who enter Griffiths Air Force Base in upstate New York in the early hours of the morning and hammered and poured blood on a B-52 bomber. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. On the day we record, Trump and his cronies are trying to engineer a coup in the country of Venezuela. At the close of the day, it appears the coup has failed. One of the coup leaders, Lopez, according to Al Jazeera, is hiding in the Spanish embassy, and several defecting military officers are in the Brazilian embassy. Of course, the U.S. government wants total domination of Latin America. Only a very few American politicians have criticized the coup. Without expressing any support for Maduro, it's up to us to expose the coup and its allies, even uniting in this effort with people we oppose passionately on other issues. In Connecticut, another police shooting, this one a fatality. The man shot was Anthony Jose Vega Cruz, nicknamed Chulo. Weathersfield, Connecticut police claim that Chulo, who was being stopped for a traffic offense, decided to run down a police officer. Chulo! one of y'all for being here because we want justice and we're gonna get it yes. we're gonna get it justice. let's go justice for Chulo! Justice for Chulo! in new haven a community and union protest of yale policies shared its rally with those protesting police shooting and injuring of one person in a parked car on april 16th at this time, I want to introduce the uncle of Paul Weatherspoon. Let's hear it for Rodney Williams. First of all, on behalf of my family, um, we want to tell you guys thank you. Um, when you look at you guys coming out here and um, the support, um, the unity, um, there's a lot of people that are speaking on behalf of my family. Um, what, what you guys doing right here, um, this is what should happen. Um, when a storm can't move without the eye, okay? You guys the storm, my family's the eye, we together, we move together. From the Coalition for Ethnic Studies, Grace Ambrosi, is she here? All right. Come on, let's hear it for her. The most exciting thing that has happened, young people stepping up. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming. My name is Grace Ambrosio, just said from the Coalition for Ethnic Studies at Yale. Yale. Yale hire us, Yale stop shooting us, Yale teach us, okay? Yeah, come on now. Our coalition is here to learn about our communities. It is here to learn about the power that is found there. And Yale has explicitly not supported us because we are learning about how to break it down. We are learning about how to be in community with New Haven residents. We are learning how to be in community with people outside of this area that would break Yale down. Do we want Yale broken down? No racist! Come on, let's hear it! No racist! Police! No racist! Police! No racist! Police! No racist! Police! New Haven! Let's hear it from 
my brother, Elazar, a.k.a. Zar. Come on, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Hello, everybody. My name is Elazar. I've been living in New Haven for five years. And the one thing I can say is I am tired. I am tired of the police shootings. I am tired of the broken promises. I am tired of having to do this day after day, year after year. Who else is tired of this? But one of my sisters that happened to be with Double Kin, she's a part of my union family and she's a part of my community family. Came up in the same hood and the same hill and we walking strong together nationally in the black leadership training program across this country. Let's hear it for none other than Barbara Fareed! Right now. You are right. Do what right. you do. Do what you do. Speak your heart. What I will say is my name is Barbara Marine. Say. I'm a chief steward and a leader in my union, Local 34. Yeah. I am a resident of New Hallville. Yes. I'm a resident of New Hallville. That is triple bills. But as a leader in Local 34, for over 35 years, we have been fighting for social and economic justice. Yes. We started out fighting for equality for women and women wages. Yes. We, we fight to hold Yale accountable not only to our contracts and the promises that they made to this community, but to each and every one of us. We, we support the graduates, we support Local 33 and their vision to organize and have a union on this campus. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who wants a union, to have a union. Yeah. We fight for justice for Stephanie, we fight for justice for Paul. Yeah. We stand here united because the only way we beat a $29 billion in, uh, um, institution is by unity, by all of us coming together and standing together. Yeah. United we stand, United we fall. United we stand, United we fall. Justice for Stephanie, Justice for Stephanie. Justice for Paul, Justice for Paul. Justice for Stephanie, Justice for Paul. Justice for Stephanie, Justice for Paul. Now you see what I'm talking about? Yes. I want to take a moment to salute some of the people who leafleted and protested a Max Blumenthal book event in New York City. This is a photo of some of them. Blumenthal once had good politics on Palestine and Syria. But at the end of 2015, after a trip to Russia, he became a wretched opponent of the Syrian struggle. Now he repeatedly denounces and lies about Syrian activists and particularly defames the white helmet rescue workers. We have a little bit of video of someone sitting in the back of the room of the talk Blumenthal insults several who attended the talk, calling them the Committee for the Proxy War Against Syria. Then he spins a lie about who Assad let out of jail. The Syrians in the audience disputed him. Um, and the third question was um, my friend in the back who was part of the uh, protest group, um, the committee to continue the proxy war in Syria, but you make uh, you made an interesting point, a point I've heard a lot before, and what you were saying was that Bashar al-Assad let out Zahran Alush and figures who would later 
um, become ISIS leaders from prison in a general amnesty in 2011. And this is part of the kind of, um, one of, one of the pieces of disinformation that is advanced that bears very strong similarity to the disinformation about Saddam Hussein being connected to Al Qaeda, which was cooked up by the neocons. And we have neocons like Michael Weiss, who constantly hammered on this, um, who was a veteran Israel lobbyist. There was a general amnesty, Alush was let out, but it was because that was the key demand of the Syrian opposition at the time was to let them out. And the Assad government agreed because it was trying to manage the ebb and flow of the insurgency. But it wasn't just Islamists who were let out. It was common protesters, anarchists, all kinds of people who were wrapped up in the opposition to the government. And so the idea that they had this secret plot to basically kill their own citizens through people that we know Saudi Arabia was arming and funding, who wound up putting Alawites in cages and parading them around and slaughtering people. It's no truth. It's not the truth. Well, I'll show you the video right now on my cell phone. The Alawi. The Alawi. I come in from Latakia, from the Alawi area. Yeah, well, I, that area would have been cleansed if the U.S. It's got the, its way. The Assad, the Assad, he killed. Look, man, you've had the microphone, not just now, but you've had the whole Adam. mainstream media it's saying what me. you wanted to say. You're Somebody a white guy shouting down Syrians? Come you've on, man. you had a platform endlessly, and so now it's time no, to No, you have to side. defend Syrian I'm sorry people. you your big war. You support the regime. Support you support the regime. You support the Assad. This is nonsense. The National, back in 2014, interviewed a former Syrian intelligence operative who said Assad's people deliberately let out the worst Islamists to cause trouble for the rebellion. Yes, Assad did let out some others under popular pressure. But at the same time, his forces were arresting thousands and throwing them into the death prisons like Sidnaya. And all the while, Assad and Putin's jets bomb and slaughter those in Idlib. Ya Allah, ya Allah, ya Allah. الطيران الحرب الروسي يقصف مدينة اللطان من بريف حما الشمالي والدخان يتصاعد 30-4-2019 ولا يزال طيران العدوان الروسي في الأجواء Now another section of Frida Berrigan's talk about nuclear weapons and the brave people who oppose them at promoting enduring pieces, Schaefer Lecture. Our dad faces years in jail, and in a February jury trial, he's convicted of burglary, conspiracy, criminal mischief, and he's sentenced to five to ten years in jail. Somewhere between the action, uh, his trial, and his conviction, my sister Kate is conceived. And the story goes that when my mom comes home from the doctor's appointment, that pronounces her pregnant, she takes a little slug of scotch. Whoa. Um, Liz McAllister turns 42 just uh, two weeks after my sister is born on uh, November 5th, 1981. At that time, the doomsday clock is at four minutes. Is that about right? Four minutes to nuclear midnight. Moved in January of 1981 in response to the flat unwillingness of either the United States or the Soviet Union to reject publicly and in all circumstances the threat of striking the other first. Both sides willfully delude themselves that a nuclear war can remain limited, that it can be, even be won. In, in 1980, both sides officially declared nuclear weapons thinkable. Episode, what is this, episode four, right? November 20th, 1983. And by that time, I am nine and my brother is eight. And our little sister, Kate, has just turned two. And as a general rule, we're not really permitted to watch television, the three of us. Uh, we can only watch the nightly news. And we live for those uh, commercials 
and our father sits right there and he turns the volume down for the commercials, but we can still kind of, we can still, we get the gist anyway, right? Um, so, uh, so we don't get to watch much TV, but on this random Sunday before Thanksgiving, we Berrigan children, we older ones, get a special treat. And we're allowed to watch a television movie with our parents. Oh my god, so exciting. Uh, the movie is called The Day After. Oh. Right? Perhaps you guys have watched this. You all, you all watched this movie. Uh, more than 35 years later, before I you know, looked it up on Wikipedia, uh, the details of the film were vague. But the outline is clear, right? The film imagines a nuclear attack on the United States and the lives of people lucky enough, unlucky enough, uh, to be survivors uh, of those attacks. After the film, we sat with our parents and our mom told us uh, that she was going to do an action soon and that uh, uh, her action was aimed at keeping what the film depicted uh, from happening. She later wrote about this conversation, our children have grown up with these nuclear realities as part of the air they breathe. They've seen many people in the community in which we live, including their mom and dad, imprisoned for resistance to nuclear abolition. But to have mom do something like this and face her possible absence. What's up, New London? Hi. Hey. Sorry. What? No problem. Big accident when my Yeah. Mm. And so I start over. I go back to the beginning. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. There's a tape, Bob. We can watch the tape. Um, where was I? It's my, my inner shtick coming out. Um, oh, yeah, so, uh, so my mom is, is talking about uh, this conversation that we have. But to have mom do something like this and face her possible absence, absence from our day-to-day -day lives uh, for an indefinite period of time, this was a large step. She continues, they were willing to accept the personal ex uh, sacrifice of my absence as their part in trying to stop nuclear war from happening, as their part in trying to avoid the suffering that the, uh, that the movie displayed. It was a moment of extreme clo closeness for the four of us, a moment of accepting together uh, whatever might come. And we concluded our conversation with prayer and big, big hugs. 35 years later, reconsidering this story as a, as a parent myself, parent of three, it strikes me as a very calculated move. It strikes me as a mom power play to show us this movie and uh, engage in this com uh, conversation. Uh, President Ronald uh, Reagan watched uh, the day after uh, two. He watched it a few weeks before it hit television screens and he wrote in his diary that the film was very effective and left me uh, greatly depressed. It must not have stuck uh, his, uh, his depression because less than a year later, you know, we, we all heard him joking, right, that bombing begins in, in five minutes. Nearly 100 million people watched the day after on its first broadcast. Uh, back, in those, back in those days where we all sat down and we watched the same show at the same time. 100 million people, it was a record uh, for um, a made-for-television movie. But very few uh, followed up uh, that night of, uh, of terror and uh, dislocation uh, with an action uh, like our mom's. So November 24th, uh, 1983, four days later, uh, my mom is one of seven who enter Griffiths Air Force Base in upstate New York in the early hours of the morning and hammered and poured blood on a B-52 bomber. We were in Syracuse uh, at the time with my dad's brother and his family uh, when it happens. They were there to celebrate Thanksgiving. It took hours for base security to learn uh, of the breach and, and to arrest them. Uh, in fact, they had to call. They found a phone inside of one of the air uh, hangers and uh, called the operator. Hello. <laughs> Um, uh, they're initially charged with sabotage, conspiracy, destruction of government property, and they face 25 years in jail. We are, as I said, nine, eight, and two. They're eventually tried in federal court in Syracuse, and I remember their trial as a strange mixture of freedom and scrutiny for my brother and sister and I. Our mom and dad are caught up in the trial. 
Um, you know, there's lots of people for them to talk to, there's lots for them to do, and we're left to play and grapple largely unsupervised, right? kind of with a, a couple other a little posse of uh, activist kids. But we're also in the media eye, so somebody is kind of watching us all the time. And uh, People Magazine called us troopers to the extreme uh, when they covered mom sentencing in July of 1984. Our dad tells this same reporter, they don't cry. They've been raised in a resistance community. They've seen their mother and father repeatedly brought to jail for nonviolent civil disobedience. And we did cry, um, but uh, the reporter didn't see it. And most often than not, uh, our dad didn't see it either. Um, our mom ends up serving 26 months, a little bit more than two years, in Alderson uh, Federal Prison in West Virginia. And we fall into a rhythm of traveling there once a month for a long weekend. The powers that be conspire that, uh, that each one of those weekends where we miss a Friday at school is a, is a field trip uh, for our whole class. Uh, they go to Hershey Park. Uh, they go to Six Flags. Uh, they go on nature adventures. Honest to God, every single time we leave, they do something really fun. Um, and uh, uh, every month my father writes a long excuse my children from school letter, uh, like we all do. Uh, but in these letters he uh, reminds uh, our teachers that our mom is in jail for her anti-nuclear action. And he sees this as an opportunity for education, right, to, to just kind of continue uh, the, the learning process. Um, we bypass this impulse. We figure out a way to relate exclusively with the school secretary for these early dismissals on these fraught Fridays, as we come to call them. And we're not the only kids with moms in jail uh, in our school, but we are certainly the only ones whose dad writes a polemic, a monthly polemic about it. These uh, early actions and our participation in them as extreme troopers is, uh, is happening at a high point of anti-nuclear uh, opinion and activity in the United States uh, and throughout the world. Right? So going back a little bit, we have 2,000 clamshell protesters in, in, at the Seabrook, Seabrook uh, nuclear power plant in May of 1977, 1,400 of whom are arrested and held in jails and National Guard armories for up to two weeks. And Joanne Sheehan, uh, who is my mother-in-law and an activist with uh, War Resisters League, is instrumental uh, in this series of actions and the jail, jail solidarity that follows. June 1982, more than a million people, and perhaps everybody in this room, uh, uh, crammed Central Park for a demonstration against nuclear weapons. And then uh, in the days that followed, the, nuclear, uh, the, the War Resisters League organizes blockades at each of the uh, missions uh, of the nuclear weapon states. Um, and more than 1,000 people are arrested. And uh, you know, just a badge of pride uh, to some of them that they are arrested at more than one uh, of the missions. And I think, Joanne, correct me if I'm wrong, that a couple people were able to get all five, right? Yep. Hardcore, right? And uh, in uh, April uh, 1983, uh, there's a, a human chain 14 miles long, 70,000 people uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom uh, against uh, nuclear weapons and US uh, targeted missiles uh, being on British soil. And the women of Greenham Common uh, are there you know, for 19 years, right? They're holding down uh, that resistance uh, for 19 years until the camp is officially disbanded in the year 2000. So this opposition to nuclear weapons is both broad and deep, right? The nuclear freeze campaign uh, delivers uh, signatures uh, to the US and Soviet missions, uh, to the United Nations, and there are 2.3 million people, 2.3 of you and I, who signed those uh, petitions. And a referendum that followed uh, was on the ballots in 10 states, in Washington, D.C., in 37 cities and uh, counties uh, around the nation. Um, and at the time uh, of the election, the freeze referendum was the largest on a single issue in U.S. history up until that point. Right? So there's just 
there's, you know, people are talking about it, they're thinking about it, uh, they're, they're motivated to action around it. I'm sure that every one of you can flip back through your own consciousness uh, and find one of these activist happenings, or, or perhaps all of them, and many others uh, that you participated in, times you felt powerful and unified and sure, sure, or at least incredibly hopeful that we were right at a tipping point, right at a tipping point towards nuclear disarmament. We worked so hard uh, for uh, nuclear abolition, and, and we still, and we're still doing that work. I'm trying to keep track of my time a little bit here, so I don't put you all to sleep. Uh, five more times throughout his life, my fa father carried out Plowshares actions, and he helped to organize and support countless others. Um, and I can talk about uh, those more in the Q and A. Um, if you want, I'm going to just kind of skip ahead a little bit here um, and go to the, the last one uh, that he participated in. Uh, so December 19th, uh, 1999, uh, Plowshares versus Depleted Uranium. Uh, in that action, uh, the group uh, cut through a fence at the Air National Guard base in Essex, Maryland. Uh, they poured blood, hung a rosary and a banner, and hammered on two A-10 Warthog bombers. All were charged with malicious destruction of property and conspiracy. Um, and, and by that point, uh, I, I'm out of college. I'm a, I'm a full-on grown-up uh, living in uh, New York City. I have an apartment in Brooklyn and a, uh, a job at the New School for Social Research, where I, I work as an arms. Uh, I work for uh, an arms analyst and a public intellectual by the name of Bill Hartung who runs a little project called the Armed Security Initiative at the time. And I feel incredibly lucky uh, to have a job like this and, uh, and very uncomfortable uh, with my good fortune. And I was grateful uh, around that time to find the War Resisters League as a young adult and, and start working with them. And I always thought of it as a sort of, um, like, not that I was like a Wall Street trader or anything, but that uh, just the idea of being able to make a living uh, doing this kind of work. Um